Okay, so let's start then. Welcome to our third session. Uh, today we're gonna talk about model selection and validation. And so far uh, in round one and round two, uh, we talked about uh, how to decompose real life problems and uh, formulate them as a machine learning problems. Uh, we know what is a data point uh, and that it's characterized by features and labels. Uh, then we also know the components of machine learning like uh, loss uh, and model. And what we've been doing so far in round two, uh, we've been using our uh, data set to uh, train or feed some model. We use uh, linear regression. And then we use also some loss or metrics to uh, estimate how well our model performs on the same data, right? Uh, if we go back to definitions of machine learning and the goals of machine learning, uh, there is uh, one example here on the slide. Uh, it is always uh, emphasized that the goal of machine learning is to uh, perform well on a new, previously unseen data, or to make predictions on a new uh, unseen data that we'll, for example, collect in the future. Uh, during the uh, training, we use some label data set with the uh, uh, labels, and we use these labels to train the model and to uh, compute the loss or some metrics. But in the future, we would like to use some uh, data points that maybe doesn't have any labels and we want to make some sort of uh, regression predictions or some uh, classification predictions. So, um, there, uh, this is uh, becoming a problem here because if we think about what we've been doing so far, uh, we've been using the training set, we've been training the model on this set, and then we estimate how this model uh, performs on the same set. So will this kind of uh, workflow uh, be a, a sort of a good estimation of how the model will uh, generalize uh, in the future or how we'll behave on the uh, unseen new data points? Well, the answer is uh, quite obviously no, because uh, the training set that we are working with is just a small subset from uh, some unknown data distribution. And uh, our uh, model will most probably overfit this training data. Uh, in your notebook, you had an illustration of this uh, process of overfitting on the training data. And you can see here uh, that the training data, of course, it's a, like a simplified uh, trivial example, but still it uh, like, uh, makes a point. Here we have a training set consisting just from uh, four data points, like uh, these orange crosses. And then there are uh, some other data points that we are uh, not aware of. So these are sort of uh, uh, new or unseen data. And then we have two models. One is the simple model, the linear regression. So linear regression has only two parameters, intercept uh, and slope. And then we have some polynomial uh, of degree uh, four. So it has uh, four parameters plus also intercept. And we can see that this uh, complex model with many parameters, it fits our training data perfectly. So if we compute the training error, uh, the training error will be zero. And then uh, linear regression or just a linear predictor fits uh, this training set uh, also uh, quite good, but uh, the uh, training error are gonna be a bit higher than for polynomial. So if we're going to use uh, only training error as the estimate of the uh, generalization ability of the model, we obviously uh, choose the polynomial. And it's obvious that this polynomial is not the good model, actually. It overfits the training data. 
So why this uh, overfitting happens? Well, it depends on two things, uh, the data and the model that you're using. Uh, it depends on what kind of data you have, how, uh, how many data points you have. Is it a large data set? Is it a small data set? And how representative is this training set? If you have a small subset of uh, data, which not really represents the distribution of uh, all the other data points, uh, by fitting to this training data set, you will get a bad model. And then it also depends at the same time what kind of hypothesis or model you have. It is very complex uh, model, like for example, artificial neural networks have so many parameters, like thousands, hundreds, thousands of parameters, or it's something simple like, uh, uh, linear regression. So the combination of these two factors, so the data the hypothesis, uh, will uh, kind of define how well your model will uh, generalize for the unseen data. Uh, as a uh, sort of a very simple rule or some crude rule, uh, ideally you should have uh, much more uh, data points then number uh, of parameters of the models. And usually by parameters, we mean some uh, weights, for example. Um, there is also some theory behind this uh, model complexity or model capacity, uh, but it's uh, a bit complicated and beyond this course. But if you're interested, you can ask me, I will send you the links about uh, the uh, theoretical basis of this. Uh, topic. So how can we then uh, resolve this problem if we cannot use training uh, error as an estimation for generalization ability? So what we should do? So one thing we can do is to set aside uh, some subset of our data, and we call it validation set. Uh, and we use this validation set as a uh, kind of a new data or unseen data. So what we'll do, we will train uh, our models or fit our model uh, using only training set. And then we compute a validation error. You can use some loss or some metrics. And this validation error is going to be uh, our estimate uh, on how well the model will uh, perform in the future for the new data. Uh, in scikit-learn, we can implement this easily. We can use, uh, for example, a function train test split, where we can set the size of this uh, validation set and uh, get uh, subsets. Here they are called uh, x train, x test, y train, y test. Then what we do, we build the model. In this uh, example, it's uh, just a linear regression. Uh, then we fit our model uh, to the training data, x train, y train, and then we compute a uh, validation error. In this case, we also compute training error for, for comparison. Uh, first, we compute predictions for the training and validation sets, and then compute uh, mean square error. Um, and this uh, validation error is going to be our uh, more uh, reliable estimate on how this model will predict uh, on the new data. Uh, one common uh, error that uh, students usually do in the exercises uh, in this round three notebook is they also use this uh, validation set or test set uh, to build another model and then compute predictions and the error. Uh, so uh, the building, the using this validation set to fit, uh, to build and fit another model will just uh, negate the purpose of this validation set. So in your one of the first exercises, uh, I don't know what was the name of it. Uh, I think it was uh, student task number two, uh, compute training validation errors. So in this task, you need to only uh, uh, feed the model to the training set and use the validation set to predict the uh, uh, validation error. 
do not use it to uh, fit another model. So let's say uh, you want to do something a bit more complex than just estimating how well your model will behave in the future. Uh, you want to do, for example, uh, hyperparameter tuning. Uh, we didn't talk much about difference between the hyperparameters uh, and parameters, but uh, loosely speaking, uh, the hyperparameters are the parameters of the model that you have to set explicitly by yourself. Uh, for example, the parameters usually uh, the parameters of the model are usually those. Uh, uh, parameters that are uh, tuned by some sort of uh, optimization algorithm or for some method. So you don't directly affect those. But for the hyperparameters, you have to make a decision and choose what kind of value you are going to use. For example, uh, it could be a uh, degree of polynomial, how complex the model are, or it could be number of neurons in a hidden layer of artificial neural network, or it could be a parameter epsilon in Hoover loss, like from round two, or uh, in round two, you also uh, encountered the lasso regression and uh, this lasso uh, model had parameter alpha that you also had to choose by yourself. So those, those kind of parameters are called hyperparameters. So let's say you want to uh, choose the model with the best uh, hyperparameter value. So if we use the same kind of uh, workflow as before, we split data into training and validation sets, uh, we uh, fit models with the different hyperparameter values to the training set, and then we estimate how well this model uh, fit the validation set, and then we select the model with the lowest uh, validation error. So the question is, uh, does this, uh, model which fits best to the validation set will have uh, good generalization uh, abilities for the new data. And again, uh, most probably no, and most probably it will overfit a uh, validation set. So why does it happen? Uh, well, because we use this validation set to select the model. So we uh, use this model for the selection process. And this means that we need to uh, split some uh, one more subset of our data for the unbiased estimation of the model performance. So how the procedure uh, will look now. So we split the data into the training, validation, and another validation set. And commonly, this uh, final uh, data set that you use for uh, sort of a final evaluation of your model is usually called test set. Well, basically, it's uh, uh, also validation test, but it's a commonly called as a test set, just some terminology. It's not very important. So we split our data into the training set and validation set and test set. Now we use uh, uh, this training set uh, for finding the best parameters of the model with the different uh, hyperparameter values. And then we select the model with the smallest validation error. Uh, the one step that we can do that uh, wasn't mentioned in your notebook, um, we can actually, after, after we selected the model with the smallest validation error, we can combine this training and validation set again and retrain uh, the chosen model with this hyperparameter value on this training plus validation set, just because we want to like uh, uh, increase the uh, data set size. And then we can make a, a final evaluation uh, of the model performance on the test set. So the test set uh, should be set aside and you don't use this test set uh, for a selection process. You just need this test set for final evaluation and reporting. Uh, this is the last step of the uh, machine learning workflow. And just as a summary, if you just want to estimate uh, generalization uh, ability of your model, uh, you need to divide your data to the training and test set, 
train your data on the training set and then report what is the uh, uh, test error. If you have uh, several models, for example, you have a linear regression and you want to compare it with the decision trees, or you have uh, one type of the model, but you want to choose some hyperparameter values, then you need uh, three subsets, training, validation, and test. Uh, you train the model with the different uh, hyperparameter values on the training set, then compute the validation error, select the model with the smallest validation error, and then uh, perform the uh, final uh, evaluation that you're gonna report on the test set. Uh, so is there any questions so far about the process? Uh, yes, I put one question in the chat on the previous slide. Yes, I see. Uh, the question is, after the training with training plus validation, the model parameters will change and we'll get a new model. Uh, yes. Uh, normally, the uh, combining the training validation set should improve the performance of the model because we're the data, uh, the, uh, the size of the data set is bigger. And in principle, it should even uh, sort of improve the model performance, but uh, it's an optional step. Some people don't do it and some people do it. So you have to decide if you want to do it or not by yourself and maybe uh, try, try it out. Uh, but what is the point of uh, doing it from scratch again? I mean, I'm losing everything I found in the first three steps here I'm doing starting from scratch and creating a new model using new training set, fitting the model for the first time, then I think I lost whatever I gained in uh, first three steps here. Uh, the point was to find uh, the best hyperparameter value. So on this step, uh, when you selecting uh, the model with the smallest validation error, you also uh, chose the what kind of uh, hyperparameter value are you going to use. So, and then you use this hyperparameter value and you retrain the model, but using the training and validation set. So the point of uh, using this validation is to choose the hyperparameter value. Okay, so I still use the same hyperparameters yes. or parameters. Okay, yeah. okay, yes. thanks. Uh, another question, uh, in general, what is the purpose of model selection? Uh, well, sometimes uh, you have a you have a like a various option on what kind of model to use, and you don't know in advance which one are fits better or not. Or with the hyperparameters, you also usually don't know which hyperparameters value. Uh, are appropriate for your specific problem. Of course, there are some, you can take a look at the literature and see what uh, most commonly used parameters, hyperparameters, uh, or what commonly used models are for your problem. But uh, like if you're doing the experiments, you would most probably need to find the best solution for your uh, certain problems by uh, uh, adjusting the hyperparameters or by selecting a different model. For example, if you have a classification problem, uh, you don't know in advance which one of the model will uh, perform better, logistic regression, there is, uh, for example, uh, support vector machines, there are decision trees, there is artificial neural networks. So you need to try out uh, and see which one performs the best. Okay, so let's then continue. Um, so let's imagine that uh, we have quite small data set. So if we have a small data set and we uh, divide our data set on three subsets, training, validation, and test, 
there is a chance that uh, these subsets are uh, going to have some extreme cases or they're going to be not very um, equal because it's a small subset, there is a lot of variation. So there is a chance if you're just using uh, one validation, fixed validation set, you will accidentally choose uh, the model that performs very well on this validation set, or uh, in the opposite case, uh, the model will perform very bad uh, on the validation set. But in reality, uh, uh, it's not the problem with the model, it's the problem with this validation set, which is too small, or the data set is too small, and there is a few data points. So in this case, it's more, uh, uh, more uh, advantages to split your uh, training plus validation uh, set into uh, so-called folds. In this case, we have an example of five fold cross validation. So we have five folds. Uh, this is your training plus validation set. And then uh, you choose one part, one fold as a validation set, and then in other parts as the training data. And you perform this uh, validation procedure as normally. Uh, you perform training on the training data and compute the validation error. But then what you do, you choose another part. Uh, in this case, it's fold two, and uh, it's gonna be our new validation set and the training that are gonna be different data points. So you're kind of uh, shuffling uh, the data points and you have uh, different data points serving as a validation set and different data points serving as a training set. And this is uh, usually a, a better approach for the smaller uh, data sets because then you can compute the average of these validation errors. And this average is going to be a more reliable, better estimate for validation error than uh, one fixed validation set. And as uh, usually, there is also a test set, which are uh, withheld and not touched until the final, final, final step. So this one is just sits there and waits until the process is ended. And um, uh, there are different variety of how you can do this process of this cross validation. Uh, in the notebook, we just use very simple one, which is in scikit-learn called kfold. We use this kfold class uh, where you just uh, divide this training plus validation set into the equal uh, parts. And then you just shuffle these parts uh, where one part is uh, validation uh, set and in other parts are training. There is a different variations of this uh, basic procedure. There is, for example, a shuffle split. So the idea of the shuffle split that you uh, set the uh, validation set size, you know what kind of size you want, and then you choose randomly uh, the data points which will be serving then as the validation set. So every, every uh, like a split going to be slightly different and the data points are chosen uh, randomly. So that's why it's called a shuffle split. Uh, then there is also commonly used a stratified K fold is usually used for um, a classification problems uh, for unbalanced data set. For example, if you have a classification problem and you have a, a few data points uh, for one class, but many data points for another class, in this figure, uh, this class represented as this bar with the colors. So there is a few data points in this blue class, but much more data points in this uh, brown class. So, and uh, quite often you want to preserve this uh, ratio uh, like of the number of samples in the class. And that's where you can use the stratified k fold. In uh, each split, it's going to choose the um, uh, data points uh, with the same uh, proportion of the classes for the test set or validation set and for the training set. 
uh, and there is also a stratified shuffle split that do, does the same procedures. Uh, stratified KFOL, but just uh, chooses the data points randomly. And this is just a few examples. I linked the reference here. If you click on this uh, CV with scikit-learn, it will bring you to the uh, scikit-learn uh, docs website and um, here you can see the description of different uh, options that you have. Simple k-fold, repeated k-fold, there is also leave one out. So there is a, a lot of options, depends on what kind of data you have. If you have some uh, additional, uh, for example, grouping parameter and you want to include this grouping parameter in your cross-validation procedure, you also can do that. So if you're interested in different options, you can uh, check out the documentation. Um, in your student task, you've been asked to do the five-fold cross-validation. And uh, you can uh, implement this task by using two for loops. You use first for loop for uh, iterating the hyperparameter values. In your case, it was uh, uh, the number of features. And the inner loop uh, you use for uh, iterating the indices uh, returned by this uh, uh, k-fold object. Uh, inside this uh, second for loop, what you need to do is to first uh, create a model, and then you feed uh, the model to the training set. And the training and validation set in this case are determined by the indices returned with this k fold object. So you use these indices and you define your training set and uh, the validation set. Uh, in our specific case, we also need to uh, choose the number of features by using the, uh, this variable from the outer loop. And then you need to compute the predictions for the training set and validation set and the training error and validation error. When you go out from this uh, inner loop, uh, so remember about the indentation, so the indentation should be correct. Uh, when you finish with the inner loop, you go to the outer loop and compute the uh, average of the training errors uh, and average of the validation errors across uh, these five splits. And uh, that's basically how you can implement the task. There are different varieties. Uh, I saw students did a bit differently this task, but I think this is the simplest way to, to finish it. Uh, this kind of code is a bit uh, involved. It's uh, gonna be a bit too much if you have to do it from scratch every time, right? And for example, if you have many hyperparameters, you would need to include uh, uh, one more uh, for a loop for each hyperparameter to iterate over all these values. So instead of doing it uh, like manually with the for loops, what you can do, you can use this uh, grid search CV function. And you had a student task about how to use this grid search CV. So uh, this grid search uh, cross validation is does basically the same as you did for the uh, this uh, five fold cross validation. The principles is the same. Um, this uh, class performs this cross validation uh, under the hood. And why does it called grid search? Well, because when you pass the parameters uh, or hyperparameters uh, to this grid search function, uh, it constructs the grid of the combination of different hyperparameters. For example, uh, in this example, we have a hyperparameters kernel and hyperparameter C. Uh, each hyperparameter has uh, two possible values that we want to check. Uh, linear, RBF, and for the C, 1 and 10. So uh, then this function constructs the grid uh, that consists of the values uh, uh, of these both hyperparameters, linear, the linear kernel plus uh, C1 and uh, linear kernel plus 
uh, C value 10, RBF kernel uh, with the C value 1, and RBF kernel with the C value 10. So it just uh, iterates through all possible combinations of these uh, hyperparameters and performs the uh, cross, uh, cross validation. Uh, you can uh, decide by yourself how you perform the cross validation. For example, you can use this uh, k-fold object that you used uh, in the previous tasks, uh, set some uh, parameters here, for example, number of splits, shuffle. Uh, below, you can see that there is a model defined. In this case, it's not a linear regression, it's uh, some classifier um, support vector machine. And then you need to pass uh, your model, or uh, in the docs, they refer to it as an estimator. In this case, it's this uh, SVC. Then you pass the dictionary with the parameters. Um, and then you can also pass the how you do the cross validation to the parameter CV. And um, then you just fit uh, the, the data that you have. And internally, uh, the cross validation is going to be performed. In this case, uh, 6K fold. And uh, all the values of these uh, hyperparameters are going to be checked. And then you can find out what are the best combination of the hyperparameters uh, by using this uh, 6K fold. Um, if you check the documentation for the um, research CV, you can see that this cross validation procedure had some default values. Uh, for example, for uh, regression uh, problems, uh, the default is the K fold and it has five folds. So it uses the same K fold that we use in the task, but it just uh, happens internally under the hood. Uh, in the case of the classification problems, uh, default uh, uh, parameter is the stratified k fold. So it uses this class uh, for uh, this uh, uh, dividing these uh, classes uh, with the same ratio as it in the original data set. Uh, but you also can use uh, other options, for example, CV splitter and some kind of uh, array of indices. Um, is there any questions about uh, the use of grid search CV? The question is, um, <clears throat> is it always the most important to minimize the validation error with respect to alpha? Uh, or is it the distance between the validation and the training error? Um, the distance between the validation and training error. So uh, normally it is advised first to, before even um, starting to do any kind of uh, hyperparameter tuning, for example, uh, you can check what is your uh, training error and the validation error. And uh, in most cases, the training error should be lower than validation error. If your training error is the same as the validation error, uh, you might, there is a chance that the problem is not overfitting, but underfitting. So the distance between this uh, validation error and training error uh, matters. Uh, but as long as it is, uh, as long as you confirm that uh, the, what happens there is overfitting, you can safely just uh, concentrate on uh, minimizing the validation error with the with respect to alpha. But if you suspect that um, 
your validation error is the same as the training error, uh, then you might uh, benefit from maybe using more complex model uh, with more parameters because it might be indication of underfitting actually. So it depends uh, on the specific case. But yeah, you need to also consider the, the case with the underfitting. Does this uh, answer your question? Uh, yes, but my question actually came from the fact that I start trying different things and with the last task. And then in the end, I tried like a really big uh, alpha values, mm -hmm. like in, not big, but like 100 or 150 different alpha values. And then I found that the validation error is that the result is a bit different to to this that that we found here. So it's not anymore zero point zero one, the one that uh, minimized the validation error is something like something else. But I can see that on that point, the training error is also going up. Mm -hmm. So uh, my question, that, that's why I was thinking like, okay, so should I just minimize the training error, the, 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 the validation error, or should, should you, or should you check both? Yeah, you actually, you yeah, would like to maybe keep track on both in the case if you like select some ridiculous numbers that mess up the algorithm completely and your model just don't fit neither training or neither validation error. So yeah, that's a good point. But you can also post your uh, research results on the Slack and we can see what's happening there to, to make uh, more, more insights. Okay. Okay, thank you. And uh, about the grid search CV, I hope uh, it's clear how to use it and uh, what what's it doing in the inside. If not, you can maybe ask ask a question or maybe later ask on the Slack. But um, yes, I think that's that's basically it. The only thing that I wanted to also just uh, briefly mention that you also encountered these uh, penalized optimization uh, problems for the first time. Uh, you saw the read regression and loss regression where we are trying uh, not only to minimize uh, the mean square error, uh, the difference between the predicted label and the true label, but we also have some additional term, uh, regularization term or a penalty term also called, uh, we can uh, control how, uh, how this uh, penalty term uh, important uh, for the optimization problem by using this uh, alpha parameter. So the bigger this alpha, uh, the more, the more uh, important this penalty term gonna be during the optimization. And basically uh, what this uh, kind of uh, formulation uh, of the loss function does, they are trying to uh, penalize the model uh, for their complexity. So this, uh, for example, here we have a, a square of the L2 norm of the weight vector. So, and the weight vector is the parameter of the model. So what this reach regression trying to do, it's penalizing the models with the high uh, weight values. Uh, the same does the last last regression, but in slightly different way. Uh, the bridge regression usually tends to uh, push uh, all the weights uh, somewhere near to zero, so the weights are not too large. Uh, and uh, last regression usually serves as a sort of a, a feature selector. It's uh, if you check the output of your last regression, you maybe notice that there are a lot of zeros there. And the reason is, uh, is because this kind of uh, penalty term forces the weights uh, to be zero. So in a sense, the uh, last regression can be used as a feature selector to select the most important features 
for the regression problem. But we didn't uh, uh, go very deep into the discussing these problems. It just uh, let you know that there is a different kind of formulation uh, to, uh, to prevent the uh, overfitting uh, by reducing the complexity uh, of the model. Okay, this is it uh, from my side. If there are more questions, please ask. I hope everyone uh, uh, did fine with the homework, with the student task and the coding.